Good day, this is Terry DeFazio and you're watching Dial It Up. Today my guest is Vince Aluzzi. I'm not even going to bother with his title because everybody knows who he is <laughs> and he's got so many things and uh, so many irons in the fire he's going to tell us all about him today. Vince, it's the second time on the show and it's good to have you on. Well, thanks for having me back. I thought after the first time I'd never be on the, on the uh, screens of any KTV again. Well, no. Just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. We, had, we had a good show. Yes, and, it, and the, uh, the time flew by. There's several topic, topics we're going to uh, be discussing today. One of which was, I think you had, you had some sort of hydro project you want to talk about? Well, uh, it's a topic that has come up again uh, about 10 years after the first opportunity came and went. And these are the hydroelectric dams on the Connecticut and Deerfield rivers in Vermont. Okay. Um, the closest one to here, I think, is in Waterford. Okay. And these generate, on average, about 130 to 133 megawatts of electricity a year. Mm -hmm. uh, renewable green energy. Uh, the Connecticut River Basin you know, collects the water in the Connecticut River and then of course they've got a system of dams and uh, reservoirs whereby uh, they can maximize the electricity produced from those hydro dams. Now let me ask you a question because this, this came up in, I used to live in Springfield, Vermont. Right. And this, this, a project similar to this came up, they had about eight or nine dams down in that area in the late 70s. And people fought it like crazy until finally the town fathers gave up. Okay. They just they just gave up. Uh, I can't even think of the, the guy's name. Chet Scott was was part of that. Sure, I, I served in the Senate with Chet. Yeah, and uh, anyways, they finally just gave up because everybody kept fighting them on this. Are you running into any resistance on this? Absolutely, but let me let me further explain. Back sure. in uh, 2002, PG&E in California filed for bankruptcy and they owned the dams at that time. They had just invested a substantial amount of money to upgrade them. Okay. Um, we participated, I, I forced the legislature to form a hydro acquisition authority. We studied the issue, did the due diligence, partnered with a private company from Canada, made a joint bid, and we bid about 385 million. It sold for 505 million to TransCanada. Mm -hmm. TransCanada now, wants to get out of the hydroelectric business and get into natural gas. Um, everything's going to natural gas because it's so abundant and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So we have another opportunity to buy the, the, the hydros. Uh, the price uh, fluctuates depending on who you talk to, but the, the belief of the majority of the people I talk to is that the value has doubled to about a billion dollars oh. for these assets which uh, I extends somewhat into northern Massachusetts uh, as the Connecticut River flows uh, <coughs> down into, I think, Long Island Sound. So let me ask you this. Yeah. You said there was how, how many kilowatts of power? Depending on rainfall, whether we're having a drought or not, mm -hmm. about 130 to 133 megawatts. Okay. Uh, in terms that, we can, that the average person can understand, and I'm not all that clear on them, how much power is that compared to, say, wind power, solar power, et well, cetera? Uh, this is peak producing power because it, uh, it's not base load power. Mm -hmm. Usually they can turn the dams on and within three to five minutes have electrons flowing through the grid. Mm -hmm. So they're used primarily um, in the morning when people are getting up and there's a demand for electricity and uh, in the evening. And otherwise, as ISO, New England, calls for power, now this has been a particularly dry year mm -hmm. and the dams have to maintain minimum water flow so as to not harm the fish and other mm -hmm. aquatic biota. So what's happening is this year they're not making as much 
but nonetheless, it's peak power, and that's the power for which you get paid the most. Because when there's a demand, you pay more if there's a shortage of electricity. Mm -hmm. If uh, if if the dams are like ran ran run of the river, so called, if they were running all the time at night when there's no demand, you might get almost nothing for that electricity. Mm -hmm. So they're uniquely uh, located and uh, uh, structured such that they can produce the power on demand and maximize the return on investment. Okay. Well, then that at least my next question. Uh, and, and I'm finding this very fascinating too. One of the criticisms of wind power is all the power goes out of state. Is that going to happen here? Is we're going to run into the same problem? Because in my opinion, the problem is not with the wind turbines. It's it's the, it's the how it's administered. If if what I'm hearing is true, right, right. so is the power going to stay here, or are we going to get energy credits, or how is that going to work? Well, the way the way it works, physics primarily determines where the actual power goes. Mm -hmm. For example. A lot of Vermonters were against Vermont Yankee, and it's now shut down. Mm -hmm. However, uh, that plant, which I think uh, after its upgrade was at about 625 megawatts, all the power stays in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so in other words, you can't say I'm taking a block of power from Vermont Yankee and shipping it to California. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. It's an accounting issue. And the question is, who buys the power? and then they account for who pays for it based on how much you use. Mm -hmm. The electrons flow into the grid in the region where the mm -hmm. power source, the generating source is located. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the accounting that determines who gets the credit and who pays for the power and at what price. Oh, okay. And uh, do we have the, the power lines that can handle this? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the dams have been in place since around 1900. Right. And they were initially built to power Boston, the Boston area. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is I've read the history on this, and at that time, this very debate was taking place. Why should Vermont allow the Connecticut River to be dammed up and, and Vermont not receive any of the benefit from that electricity? Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, uh, the power companies, which of course had more influence in the Boston area because it was developed and there were more businesses, won that battle. And so the dams were owned uh, and the uh, electricity designed to be used in the Boston area. You know, now it's 116 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to uh, have access to this power, which is in our backyard, and then it also gives us a little better leverage with other power suppliers like Hydro-Quebec. Mm -hmm. If we have another source of clean, renewable energy from those hydro dams, uh, then we are in a better position to negotiate a better price per kilowatt hour with Hydro-Quebec and other providers. Mm -hmm. uh, how th This project for these dams, is, is, is it moving along? Is it hit snags or where is well, it now? Well, there seems to be opposition on, on a couple of different fronts. Back in 2002, the utilities at that time, Green Mountain Power and Central Vermont Public Service, yes. opposed it. Mm -hmm. uh, Investor-owned utilities don't like public power as a general rule. Take, for example, the CEO of Vermont Electric Co-op, which services the Northeast Kingdom mm -hmm. primarily. Uh, in addition to other areas, but uh, the entire Northeast Kingdom is served by Vermont Electric Co-op. The CEO is paid about $140,000, $150,000 a year. Before Green Mountain Power was taken private by Gas Metro, the CEO was making over a million dollars a year. Uh -huh. And the cost of public power, generally speaking, is less expensive than the cost of what they call investor-owned utility power. Mm -hmm. So there's always been friction back and forth. Consider this, down in the Tennessee Valley area, Yes. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority exists. Yes. That was subsidized by the U.S. government. Back in the 40s, wasn't it? Uh, or 50s? Could have been 30s, 40s, yeah. probably sometime around the Roosevelt era. Yeah, it, I think it was. I, I read about that. And, and, uh, and there are regional power hubs like that, southwest, northwest. And... Um, all the car manufacturers have decided to locate in Tennessee and Kentucky 
and the regions served by the TVA because the cost of public power is so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Closer to home, Niagara Falls was developed as a federal project and we often try to get a block of that power because it generally speaking is more inexpensive than investor owned power produced by other sources. Mm -hmm. Do, do, you, uh, do you foresee this going through any time in the near future? I, I don't think it's going to happen. I just don't sense the, the, the uh, momentum from the governor and the leadership of uh, the Shumlin administration. Again, I don't see enthusiastic support from Green Mountain Power, which is now owned by Gas Metro. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, uh, there are relationships between for-profit corporations than the provincial authorities. Uh, Hydro-Quebec is uh, in part owned by the province of Quebec. Mm -hmm. Gas Metro and Hydro-Quebec and the province of Quebec have very close relationships. It's not unusual in Canada to see relationships between provincial governments and for-profit businesses. Mm. So I don't sense a lot of support for this block of public power from these hydro dams being added to the mix of power that we use in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, I, I don't think it's gonna make it this time. Although I've you know, tried to get the issue front and center and, and moving forward, I just don't sense the, the support right now. You know, is, are the criticisms for this project the same now as they were back in the 70s, like I was telling you about in Springfield? What, what, are, what seem to be the criticisms? Well, uh, the, the criticism back then was, uh, Green Mountain Power and CBPS are in the business, we're doing a good job. Why should the state get involved in uh, a public power authority? Mm -hmm. uh, since that time, because of natural gas, uh, electric prices have actually fallen, mm -hmm. or in the case of Green Mountain Power, not increased very much. I think mm -hmm. they were given a recent rate hike, although some think it should have been a rate cut. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, electricity costs tend to follow the price of natural gas okay. and or oil, which are also used to generate it. And of course, oil is, in, in, is at a very low price now. Natural gas is abundant. So that's kept a lid on the increases on electricity. So some suggest that uh, for the foreseeable future, you're not gonna see an increase in electric prices like you, you did in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's too bad that we can't uh, get more renewable energy. Uh, I never cease to be amazed at how when somebody comes up with a good idea, everybody seems to fight it, and then they'll gripe about oil prices. Right. But, you know. Well, the corporations have investors, and uh, their goal is to maximize return on investment. Mm -hmm. And having 133 megawatts of publicly owned power available might upset that um, dynamic that's in place now to, to, to maximize the return on investment for the Hydro-Quebec owners. Yeah. Um, you're still prosecuting, correct? Yes. Tell, uh, are you working on anything you can discuss right now? Well, it's difficult to discuss cases that are, uh, you know, pending. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say that uh, the crime in Essex County is comparable to other parts of the state, just that we don't have as many numbers. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, offenders who live in New Hampshire and come across the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of second homes, seasonal homes in Essex County, so those are ripe for burglaries and property thefts, that kind of thing. But yeah. there are more serious uh, <coughs> offenses there. We have a, a, a case that's uh, uh, where a game warden was assaulted. You know, we take the assault of law enforcement officers very seriously. As you should, yes. Uh, you know, they, they, you have to stand behind them if you expect them to show up and, you know, maintain the peace, protect the public. So we have a case pending now with a game warden who was allegedly assaulted by a person living in the northern part of Essex County. Oh, okay. And uh, so it's very, <coughs> uh, a, it's a very busy uh, county. There's no lack of work in the criminal justice system, uh, we can put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you see crime going up or down? Well, or, or I, staying about even? I, I'm finding that it, it's becoming more the, the more serious. There are either people rep like sex crimes. I'm finding there are more 
reports of those crimes. Not all complaints result in prosecution, but nonetheless there's a lot of activity taking place. And at some point you should have somebody on the program that talks about the cases that take place in family court, which are confidential. For example, we had a case in Essex County, it was a shaken baby case. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't prove who did it, but there was no question the baby had been uh, 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 sustained uh, you know, uh, a TBI, mm -hmm. uh, a brain injury mm -hmm. uh, from being violently shaken and uh, is now uh, disabled. We're hoping that because of the child's young age that there will be recovery and ability to function in society as normal as one can expect under those circumstances. But nonetheless, the child was very seriously hurt. No prosecution, but the child was taken away from the, uh, uh, the mother mm -hmm. who uh, refused to divulge any details about how it happened, simply said, I don't know how it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one statistic that I was reading about in the newspaper is that uh, Vermont per capita seems to have more DUI cases. There seems to be a lot more, a lot of arrests in Vermont um, for, for DUIs. Now, the question I had was, is, is drinking worse here in Vermont, drinking and driving worse here in Vermont, or is it just that the police are really getting on them? Well, um, I, you know, in the city where people drive a lot uh, shorter distances mm -hmm. and there's so much traffic, it's, uh, you know, with multi lanes of, uh, of travel, I can't say that Vermont's any worse than any other state, but mm -hmm. it's easier to apprehend individuals in Vermont. Mm -hmm. We also have a number of cases that are coming through. Someday, if you ever want to talk about the developing trend of driving under the influence of drug, D U D, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody will be weaving and show classic signs of being under the influence. Uh, the police officer will administer an Alco sensor, and it comes up zero zero. Mm -hmm. But clearly, the person is under the influence of something. So now they're using uh, DREs, drug recognition experts, who will run you through a series of tests and can pretty accurately uh, determine what type of uh, drug you are under the influence of and then, of course, prosecute because it's, uh, it's against the law in Vermont to be under the influence of any drug, whether it's a legal drug or a prescription drug or mm -hmm. alcohol. You know, if you get hit by someone driving a car with lawfully obtain prescription drugs, the person is still under the influence yes. and still causes serious injury or death. Yes. So just because you've got prescription drugs, you're not supposed to drive if you're under the influence yeah. of those drugs. And those warnings come right, right with the bottles, I know, because I've, I've had a couple of them. It says, you know, right. for example, after my knee surgery, mm -hmm. they gave me something for the pain, you know, post-operative pain. And it says, do not operate motor vehicles or machinery when you're taking this, and it, it, it would seem to be common sense, and I don't know why people would do such a yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't think people quite have figured out that just because you've got a lawfully obtained drug from a pharmacy, that you th that gives you license to operate a vehicle under the yeah. influence, because you can do just as much damage. Oh, or more even. As, as, as someone who has an unlawfully acquired uh, drug or alcohol. Yeah, and um, it's, uh, <coughs> I have enough trouble um, operating a motor vehicle with the way traffic gets at times. Right. If you've ever been down to, e even for example, West Lebanon, New Hampshire, you right. get caught in that traffic snarl, you really shouldn't be under the influence of anything. It's, it's rough right. enough when, you're, when right. you're when you're cold sober, you know? Right, well as soon as Walmart opens in this area, I think you're gonna find that a lot of those traffic woes are gonna be facing the uh, Derby area. Yeah. Could very well be. Now, you're also uh, a lobbyist as yes. well. Yes. Uh, what are you working on in that regard? Well, I represent the uh, Vermont State Employees Association, which uh, represents the, ma the vast majority of state employees mm -hmm. who, are, who are in the classified system, not the people who are elected or appointed, but the people who carry on the functions of government day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're working on this summer is to enhance security at state office buildings been about a year since the social worker in Barrie yes. was uh, shot outside of her office. And the employees around the state have made a number of recommendations 
to the Shumlin administration. We lobbied the legislature to appropriate funds uh, for operational costs such as security, guards, and we lobbied the legislature for capital money to make improvements to doors and entrances and accesses. But very frankly, not much has happened since the legislature adjourned in uh, early May. So we're trying to generate movement on that front. We don't want another incident like that to happen. And oftentimes, uh, you know, if you're trying to take a person's child away or uh, in some other way restricting their their freedom to either interact with their kids or themselves, that sometimes uh, results in a very negative reaction, particularly if they're under the influence of alcohol or a drug. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of safety concerns out there, and we're trying to make sure that those are addressed uh, to the extent Vermont uh, can afford to do so. Yeah, th there haven't been any other uh, actual shootings of uh, social workers, have there? No. There have been no. some threats, though, haven't there? There are threats and there are assaults that take place. Uh, you know, uh, the FSU, the Field Supervisory uh, Unit officers of the Department of Corrections who check on people who are on furlough or probation or parole mm -hmm. oftentimes are involved in dicey situations. So their safety is uh, an issue that we're attempting to address along with uh, those who work in state office buildings where decisions are made that sometimes are not welcomed by the person who is the subject of that decision. Yeah, I had a, uh, a guardian at Lightham on once, and I was actually quite surprised when he said he never, you know, he was, he was into a situation. He never, there was never a situation where there was a brawl, just broke out. He said people might get a little elevated and there might be some yelling. But I was actually surprised when I heard that, you know, fights didn't break out. Right. I but mean, I, in a courtroom there are security people around and there, are, there have been no physical scuffles that I'm aware of, but there has been shouting and uh, people need to break people up before something does happen. Yeah, and um, <coughs> y uh, you said that I should have somebody on uh, regarding... Uh, drug, dr recognition drug recognition experts. Yes, I would, I would very much like to do that, and after the show is over, give me some names and I will definitely contact them. I think that would be good, a good, good thing. I'll just tell you, I'll tell you a very short story, and I had a couple more questions. Sure. Um, when I was in college in Northampton, Massachusetts, yeah. a couple of guys that were in the dormitory where I was living were busted for, for drinking and driving because they were weaving and everything, and, and they kept blowing zeros, and finally the cops were very, very frustrated, and they said, we'll tell you what, we'll bring you back to your dormitory and we'll let you go, but you have to tell us what you're on. And finally, when they, they told them, they, they, at the time, they, they called them downers or reds. Okay. Benzodiazepines. I see. And that's why they, they registered zero. Well, they tried the same trick in upstate New York and they got nailed. I see. But, so yeah, I'm... Yeah, the law has caught up with that because it yeah. wasn't as abused back, uh, you know, in uh, prior to the 80s. It really started to trend in that direction mm -hmm. in the late 80s and 90s. Yeah. Now it's, it's almost like a, I don't know, not an epidemic, but, you know, it's a, a system-wide problem across the country. Yeah, and uh, it's harder to detect also. Right. Uh, there, there, were, there was a time, I remember when I was a counselor, when somebody ca came in, was, was referred to me because they, they caught him stoned on the job, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I could smell alcohol on him. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I popped him for a test, and he came out with like a .05 yeah. at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. So yeah. I know how that works, and, and, and I agree with you. I, I think something needs to be done about that. You have to address that, too. Yeah, because when when I was a counselor at the prison, we had guys who were busted for being under the influence of marijuana and driving, and some of the stories were were, were hilarious. Yeah, what what other projects are you working on, Vince? Anything that noteworthy that you'd like to tell our audience about? Well, um, I think that is important. We're trying to um, uh, the, 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 the state employees, um, by by and large, don't make a lot of money. In fact. Up until um, a, a couple years ago, uh, we had state employees who were paid so low that they qualified for food stamps. Oh, wow. Most people think empl state employees are high paid and don't do any work. Well, the exact opposite is true. They do a lot of work. Uh, can you imagine being at a, a DMV counter or uh, a, uh, a, 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 you know, trying to issue somebody a passport 
or trying to determine if they qualify for health care or other benefits, uh, people get very frustrated and their tempers are very short. Mm -hmm. So they really endure a great deal. So we're, we're, we're just you know, trying to make sure that state employees get a fair break. I know people think, again, that they don't work hard. They work very hard. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes uh, for, uh, you know, they're, 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 they get decent compensation on average, but by no means are they, uh, uh, you know, going to go out and buy McMansions and uh, mm -hmm. expensive vehicles and that kind of thing. So they do the job day in and day out to keep the wheels of government uh, moving. I think you told me at one point in time, oh well, gosh, maybe five, six, seven years ago, you work for the state of Vermont, you'll be taken care of, but you won't get rich. That's exactly right. And, th and that's fine. I, th I, 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 you know, that's right. I, I think that's fine. I mean, people should be taken care of. Their basic needs should be taken care of. Yep. Uh, I, I fully agree with that. And uh, <clears throat> you run the board of directors here at one time. Yes, I was. Do you miss any of that or not? Well, there were some interesting characters. Of course, we had Charlie on the uh, uh, board who was legally blind, I think. Yeah. And um, it was through that association that I received a call one day from a person who was going out with his, his wife after she drove the car into the tree and killed him. Mm -hmm. Uh, he knew I was a prosecutor. Oh yes. And she disclosed information that uh, she did it on did it on purpose. Drove the car into mm -hmm. the tree at high speed while she was wearing a seatbelt and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course that resulted in her prosecution and, and conviction for. Uh, I can't recall what the final charge was. It might have been manslaughter. Probably it was manslaughter. Yeah, because it was pled down to seven years, I guess, or something like that. Yeah. So. That was, that was an interesting twist that probably would not have happened uh, it, but for the fact that I served on the board. Mm -hmm. But I got to uh, meet some interesting people and I think it's a great opportunity for people who take advantage of the facilities here mm -hmm. to get their word out and uh, mm -hmm. you know, share with the public what they're up to. Yeah, yeah I, I think public access is extremely important and uh, I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be in the form it's currently in because as you know, media and television is all changing. Right. You know, cable isn't what it used to be, and even satellite TV isn't what it used to be. You have a lot, a lot more. You know, you a lot have, of competition. Yeah, you have Google, you have Amazon, and, and things like that. Yeah. And uh, streaming video off the net. So yeah. things things are, are radically changing. Do you have anything anything else you would like to discuss? No, I think it's great that you continue to do this show. Give local folks a chance to talk about what they're doing, and uh, I often find watching a program like this, you always learn a little bit. Uh, that you may not have known when you started the program. Well, I know that every time I have you on, I learn a lot more. <laughs> I, I, I hear about a whole bunch of things, and you know, it it should serve people to to listen to the to these things because there's always more to the story than what you hear on the surface. Right. And, and you, uh, TV stories are about two minutes in length. Yeah. And you really sometimes can't get the entire depth and perspective of uh, the issue surrounding uh, mm -hmm. a particular. Uh, you know, event or person until you really mm -hmm. sit down and talk about it. Vince, it was great having you on our show. We're out of time. All right. Thank you, Terry. And I will have you on again. Thank you very much. Th that's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> this is Terry DeFazio for Dial It Up here on NEK TV saying, have yourself a nice day. See you later.